Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the MISC seminar on in person and on Zoom. I have to. OK. All right. I got it right. Finally. Um, so I'm happy to uh, welcome Dr. Um, Rosie Bellini from Cornell Tech here to UMSI. Uh, Rosie is a great friend and also a wonderful scholar. Um, she's currently a, a postdoctoral fellow in HCI and computer security at Cornell Tech uh, in New York City. Rosie's research interests lie in understanding how and why online and offline adversaries use digital technologies to abuse groups who face heightened risks of harm to their digital safety. In her exploration of online communities and large data sets, she tries to identify escalation-based behaviors through working with people who use abusive behavior, she calls them abusers, quote unquote, exploring harmful online communities and detecting historic patterns of abuse in large qualitative data sets in examining predictors for high-risk behaviors she has been interested in offering best practices on how we do risk detection sensi sensitively and ethically in the computer science and security fields her domain of interest for those uh, questions are in-person intervention for abusive behaviors adversarial communities online specialist services for intimate partner violence and financial abuse so with that said, thank you so much, Rosie, for being with us today and sharing your work. And I'm going to just pass this microphone on to you and take it away. Um, for questions, we'll do questions. Those of you who are on Zoom, you can uh, post in the chat. Those of you in the room, you can just raise your hand, ask questions, and I'll moderate that at the end. Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Naz. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm really honored to kind of kick off this seminar. And I'd like to thank Naz very much for inviting me and hosting me. Um, and I'm just going to uh, kick off straight away um, with, as many of you can tell from the title of this work, um, from the very start, I'll be talking about very explicit descriptions of abuse and harm, um, which can be very heavy to listen to. Uh, so please kind of take a break if you need to, uh, quit the Zoom room. Um, uh, yeah, just take care of yourself. Um, so intimate partner violence or IPV uh, is a very serious and complex interpersonal problem. And it's actually really best understood as a constellation of different types of controlling and coercive behaviors. And it can manifest across lots of different types of abuse. Uh, unfortunately, despite the fact quite a lot of the time in digital design, we consider it an edge case is actually extremely common um, and it's very devastating actually when it occurs. Um, but uh, and as we're finding within the context of uh, human computer interaction and security, uh, abusers are very frequently using digital technologies uh, to extend their control and coercion over their survivors. Uh, this could be through harassing messages, uh, this could be through tracking and monitoring, uh, or it could be through identity theft, um, and these are just kind of some examples. There uh, unfortunately are many more. But when we talk about intimate partner violence, uh, abusers are very often absent from preventative approaches, uh, which I find very curious considering uh, they are the kind of the core agent which causes these kind of uh, behaviours. And this can ultimately kind of result in the fact that quite a lot of symbolic responsibility is actually placed on victim survivors um, to improve their security and safety. And this can sometimes be called safety work. Uh, so this is labors that survivors use um, to try and keep themselves safe from kind of in-person and online mediated harm. But as we're not actually challenging um, people that use these kind of behaviors, uh, this really isn't very a sustainable approach. Um, and it's also not very just as well. Um, victim survivors are often not in an opportunity to be able to uh, protect themselves from the range of harms in which they're experiencing. Uh, and so as a scholar and um, kind of as an activist and an advocate, uh, I was actually motivated for the past kind of five years to try and answer these two really big questions to try and get to the root of the problem. Um, the first one is actually how might we learn about technology abuse from the perspectives of the abusers themselves. 
um, understand why and how they do things. Um, but then ultimately use this kind of information to actually design and deploy kind of technologies which really try and challenge these kind of abusive behaviors when they happen. And, and so this talk is kind of roughly structured in, in three parts. Um, the first one is what can we learn about communities of um, people that describe abusive behaviors online? And I'll be discussing forums which we, I identified through intimate partner surveillance. Uh, I will also have a look at um, kind of digital uh, approaches uh, to community driven violence prevention, which I worked um, during the space of my doctorate. And then I argue and say all of this has to uh, result in trying to produce kind of safer online and digital spaces for survivors. And I'll conclude with discussing the work in which I've done uh, in the clinic to end tech abuse as run out of Cornell Tech in New York City. Um, so just starting off, I'll cover um, how we go about kind of finding uh, people that describe abusive behaviors online. Um, and this is actually a really interesting methodological challenge um, because it might not surprise anybody, but the discussion of abusive behaviors um, are actually, uh, most people don't do them. Uh, people might self-stigmatize. Um, they don't openly discuss these kind of things um, because using these kind of behaviors can lead to um, quite specific experiences of kind of guilt, shame, um, and self-censorship. Um, but we find that survivors, when they're given the chance, they can sometimes find the disclosure of experiencing these kind of actions um, to be very empowering. Um, but where and actually how can we hear from abusers uh, directly if it's very difficult to talk to folks in person? And a finding that I personally found within my master's uh, work in the context of bullying and harassment is the fact that uh, people that use abusive behaviors uh, will often gather around the discussion of morally gray areas. Um, so these are things which are uncomfortable to um, think about, um, generate quite a lot of controversial opinion. Um, and one of them, for example, is the discussion of an intimate partner being um, sexually in, um, in, um, committing sexual infidelity. Um, so that's when someone has cheated in a particular relationship. Um, and this is the first example of the kind of ways in which uh, abusers kind of talk about uh, uh, their behavior. Uh, so as I was having a look online, we were able to identify uh, five publicly accessible forums, and some of them are still accessible to this day, but I will be anonymizing which forums they are because I don't want to advertise them. Um, of where the suspicion of sexual infidelity is openly discussed but also it's paired with um, discussion of tech abuse and it's extremely detailed descriptions of tech abuse that people who use abusive behaviors actually use. Um, so this is just an example of some of the composite um, type posts in which we would see on these kind of communities. Uh, so often they would take on an interesting narrative structure uh, so this story here has a poster um, that is contextualizing how their particular target has started to behave differently. Um, so this person has a wife that is more social suddenly with her co-workers. This poster then explicitly describes how they get hold of their phone. Um, so this is a device compromise. They gain access to something which they are not allowed to have. Uh, and they read their text messages um, that they find suspicious. Um, and this is clearly done without their permission. Um, the, po the particular target uh, kind of responds, um, actually talking about the fact that they got cross and adds additional password protection. Um, and this poster is actually asking for ways to further perpetrate uh, intimate partner surveillance um, by overcoming these kind of password protections. Um, and this was just one of the several examples in which we were able to find of these kind of ways in which people would explicitly describe conducting tech abuse in these contexts. And despite the variation of these kind of justifications, uh, what I was able to do uh, through a thematic analysis was actually identify uh, about 25 kind of reoccurring kind of themes or aspects um, that I'm going to display um, here. 
And what's really fascinating is that many of these narratives uh, actually fit into a typical chronological walkthrough, and that is kind of consisting of a three-act structure of where there's a setup of where characters are introduced, a context is introduced as well. Um, someone uh, then confronts this particular person who they are, um, who they suspect of sexual infidelity, um, and then there is some form of resolution. And the sample narrative that I had on the previous slide actually fits one of the most kind of common narrative pathways in which we found through this analysis of a forum data set. Uh, so here someone has found digital evidence, so for example of reading um, kind of the, the, text, the, the text messages on an intimate partner's kind of phone. They're also then really motivated to kind of gather more evidence, um, they haven't answered kind of like their question. And then also they turn to advice from other forum members, and this is where they start posting on these kind of forums asking how can I get around someone's password protections. And something that's interesting about these kind of forums is despite the large variation of the different ways in which abusers describe their behaviors, uh, this actually means that their technology abuse and the way in which they talk about it is actually quite consistent. And if it is consistent, it also can be predictable. So these kind of organic discussions on these kind of infidelity forums um, can often enable or kind of escalate these kind of attacks. Um, and something that I find personally very interesting, which is if people that are using these kind of abusive behaviors online are talking about things in a predictable manner, um, it does mean that there is kind of chance to be able to predict and ideally kind of deter um, these kind of behaviors uh, before they can escalate into using tech abuse. But there's also really interesting outcomes that come from these kind of forums as well. So when abusive um, kind of people come together online, um, the dynamics of these forums can also be um, very revelationary. So this is kind of another example. Um, again, once uh, again, someone is reading someone's text messages and they're actually trying to find a way of tracking and monitoring someone's location. Uh, also, unfortunately, uh, someone's kind of coworker is also implicated in the ask of this particular poster. And from there, we can see how this community responds. Um, so we have something that we labeled as a de-escalation. And this forum member actually kind of states explicitly, you've already um, damaged her trust by reading her text messages. Uh, what good is reading her emails going to do? We like these kind of behaviors. We'd kind of consider these to be very pro-social and they're trying to discourage someone from escalating this type of tech abuse. But unfortunately, um, these kind of responses in these forums um, were in the minority. Um, and actually, um, most of the time we would see in these kind of forums, uh, something that we would call escalation. Um, so this is where responders would provide uh, kind of posters uh, with a surveillance tactic in which they seek and they would pair these up together. And in many ways, they would actually um, escalate the sophistication and severity of these kind of attacks. So in this particular example, uh, we have someone that is um, encouraging um, someone who is thinking about conducting technology abuse um, to get a voice activated recorder. Um, unfortunately, they also wish them um, good luck in these efforts. Also, Something that we found especially concerning is the fact that traditional approaches to moderation, um, such as bringing in a moderator to moderate this kind of behavior, might not work for these communities. And that's because these kind of posts were being provided by the moderators of these forums. Um, so the traditional uh, makeup of folks that would gatekeep and discourage this kind of abusive behavior uh, actually was kind of reinforcing this. Um, so a big takeaway that I was able to identify from the study is the fact that when communities of intimate partner violence abusers are able to collect online, um, they, they can directly escalate and reinforce the use of different types of technology abuse attacks.
Um, and many of these kind of tech abuse attacks that we see um, have been discussed in previous studies um, from the perspectives of victim survivors. Um, they're a very good source of information and understanding. Um, but the collaborative nature of how these kind of um, technology attacks and how they develop um, is what's inherently unique about looking at abusers directly. And we were able to identify a significant chunk of lots of different type of attack abuse vectors or attack descriptions, um, which we didn't know about um, previously. And this is coming from folks that have been working with survivors for several years on the, on the topic of tech abuse. Uh, so some of these kind of uh, approaches uh, can uh, and do uh, require physical access. And by that, I am meaning um, someone needs to gain physical access to a target or a victim survivor's kind of phone uh, to be able to install something or uh, kind of go through and read their messages. Uh, this also can include um, access to physical homes, uh, such as adding a voice or a, a video or visual recorder, such as to someone's home or car. But we also found that this didn't necessarily have to include physical access as well. Um, they might not need to access kind of a target device, uh, device um, and they might just use something which is available to your average consumer, uh, such as a shared phone plan um, or use cloud storage facilities to be able to monitor a particular person's target location um, or through tools. And then also in the category of coercion and subterfuge, um, this might involve kind of tricking a particular target um, or coercing a target to be able to share kind of passwords. Um, or they might not even need to do that either. Um, they could just shoulder surf and find out what someone is doing by looking over their shoulder. Um, and the part that really uh, kind of, I guess, uh, frustrated me a bit as well was they even recommend um, other posters uh, outsource these kind of attacks um, so they're not necessarily implicated in doing these kind of behaviors uh, so they might recommend the best private investigators uh, to monitor um, their victim or target as they go about uh, kind of their everyday lives um, if it wasn't obvious already, a major takeaway of actually having a look at what abusers are doing online is the fact that they are a very valuable and a very detailed source of threat intelligence of a way in which we haven't been able to find in the same kind of manner through um, talking to survivors. So just revisiting uh, two of the main takeaways uh, that I was able to find through discussing and identifying abusers online. So again, they openly kind of discuss tech abuse um, through common narrative structures, uh, but these are quite consistent, surprisingly, uh, which means you can predict them. And also, if we're really not careful about leaving communities of abusers online, um, despite the fact that they are very valuable sources of rich threat intelligence, uh, this also means that they're able to generate quite sophisticated um, attacks that can escalate over time. So with this understanding, uh, I have been working in a space uh, which is I, best described as community-driven violence prevention. Um, so these are efforts that are built uh, within the context of communities uh, to directly challenge and manage the behavior of people that use these kind of abusive behaviors in the local community. And what I had been doing across the space of my doctorate, and this was back in the UK, um, specifically in Newcastle and the London area, is I was supporting uh, what are best known as domestic violence perpetrator programs, or they're sometimes called DVPPs. And what fascinates me about these kind of contexts is that they promote a restorative approach to violence prevention. Um, so they are interested in promoting uh, healthy, respectful, nonviolent relationships um, and how to equip people with the tools to be able to manage very complex social situations um, non-violently uh, and also help to uh, emotionally regulate in a way which would not result in abusive behavior. 
They can also support in various kind of different ways, such as providing uh, parental support or signposting to uh, mental health services or um, substance dependency programs. And what makes these kind of environments really interesting to me is the fact that they sit alongside criminal justice system responses, uh, but they prioritize something called restorative retribution. So this is where someone is held to account by their kind of behavior, uh, but they're also provided meaningful ways to change that. Um, so they are not just the sum of their criminal activity. Um, but unsurprisingly, their role is not very easy. Um, they are very technology poor and chronically underfunded environments um, as they work with people um, that are quite frequently seen as being invisible. Um, we don't like to acknowledge the role of abusers and we don't like to acknowledge the role of abusers being in our community. And as I said, I worked it for several years in these kind of environments. Um, alongside people that use these kind of abusive behaviors uh, as they try to work through um, restorative retribution approaches. And I designed several technologies um, in this space that would ideally kind of help these domestic violence perpetrator programs uh, as they kind of progress towards their goal. Um, and this actually kind of accumulated in a, a very detailed, um, quite a long uh, focused ethnography uh, around how we can kind of manifest and encourage these pro-social environments uh, to manifest as kind of behavior change. And one of the areas in which I designed for in particular um, was trying to encourage uh, self-awareness and perspective taking behaviors in people that use uh, abusive behaviors towards other people. And so I really like this quote from one of my professional collaborators, uh, which kind of gets to the heart of the issue of designing with um, people who use these kind of abusive behaviors is the fact that quite a lot of the time um, you're working with people that are in denial in the sense that they uh, do not see their behavior as being abusive. And they also see their behavior as being inherently inevitable. Um, and they point out the fact that quite a lot of the time, abusers will manipulate narratives such as the ones that we've seen on one of the previous slides uh, to basically argue that there is no other choice other than to behave abusively within a particular situation. And, and by this, I might mean um, that someone um, might use how their um, victim survivor has behaved to make them feel a particular way that justifies how they behave. Um, but the first challenge in kind of uh, kind of designing to change these kind of abusive behaviors is if you're working with someone that's in denial about these kind of behaviors, um, they're often really unwilling to admit to using abuse at all. And these programs, particularly in the very early stages, uh, use uh, very heavily things like fictional narratives. So they talk about abuse in the abstract or they talk about abuse within the context of fiction. Um, and that's because you're able to represent um, IPV kind of dynamics uh, that can be more generative when it comes to conversations, uh, rather than putting someone on the spot and challenging someone about their abusive behaviors, uh, because if someone is going to be in denial about it, they're going to shut down and not want to kind of change their behavior. And so the core idea uh, that we uh, kind of made together as a community organization we were really interested in seeing if there was an opportunity to design a system that encourages uh, viewing abuse um, kind of primarily as a choice and reinforces this aspect of perspective taking. And the idea behind this is that if they could see their abusive behavior from the perspective of other people, such as a partner or as a, one of their children, um, they might be able to be motivated to choose to behave differently in the future. So I worked very closely uh, with two charity partners to design and deploy um, a non-linear narrative, and this was an interactive kind of storytelling system. And what we did was we designed um, specific areas of where there were predetermined kind of choice points of where different types of um, fictional characters uh, could either choose to behave abusively, um, choose to behave harmfully, um, or um, not behave kind of in this kind of manner in a way in which we'd call kind of pro-social. And these kind of choices directly impacted the outcome of this fictive story. And importantly as well, um, to represent the very complex um, interpersonal dynamics which intimate partner violence represents, 
is that if someone chooses to behave abusively, this directly restricts and hinders the choices of the other characters um, in this kind of story. Um, and what we did was we kind of deployed this system um, with 27 abusers at the very start of some of their behavior change work um, across in-person um, in, uh, domestic violence perpetrator programs. And so what we actually found was really interesting because abusers have a very paradoxical relationship involving um, choice and agency within these kind of technical exercises. Uh, and we can see this uh, manifest really well uh, in this discussion that uh, two abusive partners are having with each other. Uh, so, for example, when someone was choosing uh, a particular type of kind of narrative, uh, they were quite interested in realizing that if they choose to behave abusively, that really can out, uh, affect the outcome of that particular story. And that really helped to reinforce uh, their learning about how much control that they actually have over choosing to behave abusively in particular contexts. And then another one kind of describes and says, yes, you know, because at the end of the day, you can choose to kind of behave abusively or you cannot. And these kind of narratives are really powerful because they can also lead to actually quite a lot of disclosures, uh, disclosures around how someone is using uh, abuse in their own lives. They don't necessarily have to um, purpose the role of characters. Uh, and practitioners were really interested in seeing how we can kind of navigate and use these kind of narratives in productive and supportive ways, uh, which in many ways is somewhat the polar opposite of the forum dynamics in which I've shown in this uh, kind of presentation around kind of what happens when those environments don't have this nature of being challenged and can't see things from another person's perspective. Um, but it wasn't all positive um, and reinforcing kind of this act about someone's control over their own kind of behaviors can also somewhat backfire um, of where uh, kind of abusers uh, who kind of use this interactive system to, to choose um, even kind of pro-social behaviors um, somewhat doubled down on what we'd kind of consider as being pro-abusive behaviors. So uh, this particular abuser here um, said that, uh, okay, so I just need to keep, keep complete control of the situation to ensure that no one gets hurt. Um, and you can see the fact that they're sort of getting the idea of not using kind of abusive behaviors, but this aspect and the element of kind of controlling uh, kind of the entire situation is still pro-abusive in many ways. And one of the largest kind of takeaways I found from the several years in which I worked within these contexts is that if we are as designers and uh, working within the context of human computer interaction, really interested in managing self uh, management tools, uh, we really actually need to challenge these pro abuse belief systems that really drive this abusive behavior. And the idea behind this is the fact that if we don't challenge these pro-abuse belief systems, even if this behavior stops, it's going to manifest in different kinds of ways, which are going to be quite difficult to be able to measure in the future. And towards the end of these planner programs, I was especially interested in seeing how um, uh, basically abusive partners following kind of the end of these programs see about kind of providing support and community to other people that are also experiencing ways of learning to desist from the use of abusive behaviors. And this is kind of a real challenge. Um, it's actually quite a serious challenge because another quote that I was especially motivated with is, is that abusive behaviors actually require a lot of support to change. Um, and this is across it over a long period of time. Uh, sometimes I would work with abusers who uh, were in their 30s and 40s and all they had known um, was abusive relationships. And the thing here as well is that when we're talking about uh, domestic violence um, perpetrator programs, it's really actually very difficult to measure whether something is working or not through standard metrics or data alone. Uh, so for example, uh, kind of managing uh, how um, domestic violence perpetrator programs are structured, sometimes they can be 24 weeks, sometimes they can be 48 weeks, and that is a considerable chunk of time to get to know kind of each other in a, in a group environment. And when we lose these kind of pro-social environments that kind of encourage um, kind of holding someone account for their behavior, um, but also providing them meaningful ways to change, uh, you start to see uh, kind of abusive um, people manage and manifest that within uh, forums online. And that really kind of works against them in many ways. 
and unmoderated kind of peer support networks will ultimately as well uh, kind of produce those kind of forums uh, because uh, in many ways quite a lot of folks are having a look at trying to avoid responsibility uh, to use kind of harmful behaviors over victim survivors. And as I mentioned, measuring changes in these kind of pro-abuse belief systems uh, with data is extremely challenging. So you're not just having a look at whether reports of violence go down, uh, because although uh, at first glance, uh, this looks like the program is working, uh, sometimes that can mean the fact that the victim survivor within the context of that relationship uh, has lost faith in the um, criminal justice system or does not feel safe to be able to report that the abuse is still continuing um, and they are scared to reach out. So this measuring kind of changes um, starts to actually be uh, quite difficult to measure. But once again, uh, we were motivated to try and work with this uh, as a bit of a design challenge. And, and what we did was we designed a digital system uh, that tried to simulate an asynchronous uh, but moderated peer support network. And that was between two abuser groups. Um, of where we were trying to have a look and seeing if changes in abusive belief systems can actually be evaluated properly. And the system in which we designed uh, was something called Fragments of the Past, and I, and I designed this across the space um, of several months with um, abusive partners. And the idea behind this was kind of connecting uh, digital uh, physical artifacts uh, with talking. Um, so using kind of an embedded uh, radio frequency identification tag, uh, basically people were able to make uh, tangible artifacts and connect them with an audio reflection. And these tangible artifacts that they were making uh, using kind of craft materials as humorously many of them really did not want to be using uh, a screen. Is, is that uh, they were able to uh, make uh, representations of important stages of behavior change and how their abuse, uh, uh, pro abuse belief, uh, belief systems had changed uh, across a longer period of time. And the idea was here to ensure that this was moderated, they would pass these kind of fragments um, or uh, kind of physical representations of change uh, between two groups of um, domestic violence perpetrator programs for, for support. Uh, and with this kind of person's permission, um, I have been able to kind of share um, an example of what these kind of fragments um, of the past actually look like for people that are undergoing uh, this long stage of behavior change or this untanglement of pro-abuse uh, belief systems. Um, so we picked kind of five main um, points across um, the process of change. And um, if you kind of briefly just have a look at some of the audio reflections that are attached to these fragments, um, it demonstrates the fact that quite a lot of uh, users are interested in being able to share encouragement with other types of abusers on the fact that um, behavior change actually is possible. And this is an interesting finding because we I didn't really anticipate this to find this, but um, abusers and people that use these kind of abusive behaviors against other people, uh, they actually need to demonstrate the fact that change is possible. Um, quite a lot of them start from a particular um, uh, place of where they don't believe the fact that they can change these kind of behaviors. They feel inevitable, the fact that they are always going to behave this kind of way. Uh, and these fragments are really interesting because, uh, as this kind of quote demonstrates, uh, these kind of fragments and, and demonstrating the fact that people were talking about changing, making small changes on their behavior, was the fact that it was possible to even change. Uh, and this process is really interesting because uh, getting abusers to think about uh, and reflect on who they are as people uh, means that they engage in interesting re reflections on actually who they are. So this particular person is kind of frustrated the fact that they are constantly seen as being a perpetrator and they're wondering is everything that they do after this, um, are they always going to be seen as a perpetrator or an abuser, um, or are they always, or the, are they able to kind of change this identity through um, passing these areas of support to other peers? And uh, one key takeaway I had from deploying this kind of system with abusive partners is there's actually a lot of ways in which we can help these community driven efforts, uh, not only to kind of simulate uh, these processes of change and support without introducing or, uh, or escalating the risks, such as um, putting them online, such as online communities. 
Um, and there's also ways in which we can help uh, these kind of programs uh, measure kind of pro abuse systems or pro abuse belief systems because these are inherently valuable but very difficult to evaluate. Um, so hopefully I've managed to kind of demonstrate uh, how much we can learn uh, from having a look about abusers kind of online and also how we can actually support as uh, designers and human computer interaction practitioners, ways in which we can support uh, community driven violence prevention methods uh, actually on the ground. Um, but importantly, um, all of these kind of findings, uh, they must actually hold, uh, in my personal opinion, a survivor's safety and security in mind at all time. Uh, so if we're interested in elevating or alleviating, sorry, um, the safety work in which the victim survivors have, uh, what we actually really need to do is translate this into interventions that can help support survivors um, access safer in-person and digital spaces online. And I'll just conclude uh, with uh, one of the main interventions in which I have been helping to run for the past year, and that is the Clinic to End Tech Abuse. Uh, so the Clinic to End Tech Abuse is a technology clinic uh, that is run within the context of New York City, um, and it's run straight out of Cornell Tech. And what we do is we pair technology experts uh, with survivors of IPB, and we try and help them understand their technology abuse in which they might be experiencing. Uh, we might investigate their reports of um, uh, technology abuse, and we might advise, but certainly not prescribe um, on uh, privacy and security steps. So this is where we work with clients kind of one-on-one -on -one. And the reason I share the fact that we don't prescribe is because uh, we do we are not the experts on how that they are currently experiencing risk and survivors are the best place to be able to decide what is best for them and how that they how they see as being uh, kind of recommendations for security. Uh, and since about 2018, uh, we have served um, all five boroughs of New York City, and we have received over 400 referrals from our community partners of survivors that directly need help and assistance uh, with their technology abuse concerns. And importantly, our protocols are always constantly changing as we are constantly interested in ways of ensuring that we can improve victim survivor safety and lead to better kind of survivor outcomes. Also importantly, uh, we're constantly having to adapt as there are new technologies which end up on the market, which can be misused abusively. Uh, so for example, uh, you'll have probably seen the fact that um, air tags are quite easily available to be able to purchase. When the clinic first started, they were not on the market. We see them quite frequently within the clinic because people are misusing them to store, monitor and control um, survivors. Uh, so we're constantly having to change uh, how we respond to the ever changing um, threat of uh, technology abuse. And where I find especially interesting is that even though we are trying to best keep victim survivors kind of safe, uh, we always need to use uh, what we kind of term as adversarial thinking, or this is kind of thinking like an abuser of how we can anticipate technology is going to be used to harm. And that's to ensure kind of holistic safety planning, such as the, the style in which I used on the last slide and also ensure that we are designing technologies that do not jeopardize their personal safety. But clients actually really do um, require quite a lot of long-term support to actually manage what are quite frequently very multifaceted um, technology concerns. Uh, so just an example, I was just dealing with a client a couple of weeks ago um, that manifested all of these different types of technology abuse concerns. Uh, so we see a wide variety of different types of ways in which digital technologies can be misused uh, and all these kind of different complications and complexities. Uh, so for instance, um, we can have it of where the abuser owns a uh, survivor's device and they also uh, have purchased devices for children, uh, which means that they are able to set up these devices in ways in which a survivor is not, a, uh, not aware of, such as tracking location or monitor some usage. And because they have this kind of physical ownership, um, they can sometimes mean that they can physically access um, things like their devices because they can say, oh, I own this kind of device, you must be able to let me have a look at it. Or inherently, they can also kind of force passwords. 
also this particular survivor had um, also had their friends and family harassed at the same time and the threat of non-consensual intimate images distributed online. Um, this is quite a lot to kind of take in, but um, in many regards, I kind of uh, kind of suggest like imagine being the victim survivor who is dealing with this kind of thing, and then they're also asked to um, better protect their privacy and security. Uh, and the main reason that I think it's really valuable um, to think about working with abusers in the first place is that these kind of behaviors come from one person, um, and it is a kind of out of scope to be able to consistently ask because these aspects are so multimodal um, for one particular person to respond to it. And obviously this is extremely overwhelming and harmful for a victim. Uh, so to just round things off, um, the attacks that we witness are primarily not technologically sophisticated in nature. Um, so you'll find on the previous slide, um, quite a lot of people can do this in the sense that there is a low barrier to entry. We are not dealing with folks that um, know how to hack a particular computer system. They're just misusing technology in a way in which it might not have been originally designed for. And and the reason that they're able to do this is because predominant approaches to threats um, do not apply in an intimate partner violence context. Uh, so the assumptions that we're making about security, uh, such as the fact that an adversary doesn't own a particular device in which you're using, that they don't know intimate information about you, uh, and that um, they cannot uh, uh, basically access all of these kind of things within a shared um, domestic home, it doesn't really apply. Um, and we, as a result of this, we really need to focus on the root of the issue of technology abuse, um, which actually I would say is kind of the fact that we need to argue requiring to continuously learn about and kind of challenge um, and also support an abuser's kind of ability to be able to change because I argue that that's one of the most sustainable things in which we can do um, rather than passing on this responsibility um, to a victim survivor. Um, so I will get asked um, where I, am I currently working on as in three threads of ongoing work that I see as being valuable uh, from the projects in which I presented. I'm interested in trying to see if we can build digital platforms and tools that really challenge abusers on these kind of pro abuse belief systems and also discourage abusive behavior. Uh, I'm also interested in identifying the digital endpoints um, to anticipate when abusive behaviors are escalating, to try and see if we can signpost abusers and also victim survivors to the support and the services in which they need uh, before this manifests into uh, quite significant tech abuse uh, responses. And then finally, where I've been spending most of my time is that I'm interested in having a look about instead of waiting until someone experiences tech abuse or talks about perpetrating it, how can we have a look at doing intimate threat analyses on, on existing um, consumer-based technologies to anticipate how someone is going to misuse this abusively before we effectively wait for someone to do this. Um, and the area in which I'm specializing in at the minute is financial abuse. So how are um, the technology-enabled financial abuse experienced within the context of an intimate partnership? And all of these things uh, try and communicate the fact that if we don't consider abusers or adversaries in our approach, we are always fated to bring in the wrong threat models um, to our security approaches. Um, and we are always looking at the kind of the wrong problem in which we should really be solving, which is cha challenging uh, the abusive behaviors and when they do occur. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Uh, that might have been a very heavy topic um, for many of you to listen to. Um, please know that if you have been uh, affected by any of the topics in which you have, uh, I have discussed within my presentation, um, please kind of contact me afterwards if you want to using uh, my email and I can see about kind of signposting you towards some professional services that might be able to help. Um, I will actually be in the area actually in um, at another conference, um, which is the Battering Intervention Services Coalition of Michigan, um, the other side of Ann Arbor. Um, so do let me know if you want to kind of grab a coffee or anything around some of the, the, the topics or um, the, the projects in which I have kind of going on. Uh, so thanks very much for my collaborators uh, and I'm ready to take on some kind of questions. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you so much. Um, so can we see buttons here on Zoom? I can. Okay, great. I think I have three. 
Awesome. Um, so uh, I can just read the question. Yeah, yeah, sure. You. That's good. Uh, okay, let's do that. So there's some questions in the chat, and we all you can also ask questions in the room. So uh, we'll go, um, we'll alternate between the two spaces. Any questions in the any questions in the room right now? All right, I'll start with one from the chat. Um, in looking at your research findings, have you come across cases of relapse mm. of abusers whose behaviors have reportedly improved? If so, how does the relapse influence subsequent attempts for improvement? Do they, quote, unquote, double down on their abusive behavior, for mm -hmm. instance? Yeah. Um, that is an absolutely fantastic question because it, it's something that I would consistently talk to uh, professional services about um, because it's a, it's a morally um, and um, ambiguous kind of area. We try to discourage um, using kind of the terminology around relapse because that's a very kind of medicalized term. Um, but I, I also understand kind of where you're getting at, which is the reuse of these kind of behaviors. Uh, yes, we certainly do see the reuse of these kind of behaviors during uh, during the space of a program. In fact, in some cases, um, you know, it, it's actually quite common with particular people. Um, but in the same way in which it, you you kind of permit uh, the relapse or the, the re-engagement of other harmful behaviors, uh, there is this kind of space of where, um, although we kind of anticipate it to happen, um, it can, uh, we do try and challenge it for when it does occur and try and remind the fact that um, an abusive person um, has also uh, made progress in kind of other areas to discourage them from, as you kind of highlight, doubling down. Um, it's very difficult because we also prepare kind of survivors and victims uh, with the fact that um, there could, this uh, domestic violence perpetrator program uh, isn't a panacea. Um, it's not going to magically change someone's behavior if they have behaved in the same way for 20 or 30 years. Uh, but it does have the capability to make some change and for some people make a really big change. Uh, so trying to find ways to reassure, um, particularly when it comes to abuser partners, that um, just because they re-engage with something kind of once, um, that they should continue to uh, uh, on uh, continue to kind of strive for um, improved or kind of lesser abusive environments um, for the people in which they care about. But yeah, that's a, that's an absolutely great question. Yeah, thank you. Um, do you know the do I need a microphone or is it just what the, uh, the people okay, okay the people on Zoom can hear me? Um, questions from the room? Yes, yep. Rahab. Um, the, can you hear me? Oh, you can just raise your Okay. Um, so, hi, thank you so much for your talk. Um, so, as you mentioned, kind of interpersonal or intimate uh, partner violence is like really complicated. Mm -hmm. So, I'm curious if like there were scenarios where the dynamic wasn't simply an abuser and victim slash survivor, but both were in an abusive relationship mm -hmm. and they were uh, both kind of contributing abusive to the behavior. So, that, how does that break down in your design of the uh, towards kind of closer social media. Yeah, also a great question. I think that conversation has been happening uh, quite a lot in the news with the result of kind of some recent court cases. Uh, so we would kind of call those contexts in which you're uh, describing that we'd fit those into two um, specific descriptions. Uh, one of them is dual perpetration of where there are two abusers in a relationship with each other and they consistently kind of take turns in kind of uh, swapping between being an abuse and a victim. I will say that those are quite rare um, because the whole aspect of these interpersonal relationships mean that one person has direct coercive and control over the other. Um, but the other type of uh, relationship that we do see uh, is where um, victims use something called uh, re re um, protective force of where they might use temporarily um, abusive or harmful behaviors as a means to defend themselves. Uh, that's why I'm especially careful with the way in which we're talking about kind of male and female perpetrators is that quite a lot of the time when I work with women who have gone through this process, uh, quite a lot of the time they are victims, nearly always, um, and uh, many of the times they don't have these pro uh, abuse belief systems in the same way in which the person that they're in a, an abusive relationship does. 
Now, you always get female perpetrators as well, I will put out there. Um, they do exist, um, but they are certainly kind of in the minority. Uh, they behave in different ways to kind of male perpetrators. Um, to answer your question, I mainly worked in the context of where someone was uh, standard to medium risk, and I worked of where there was a clear instance of where there was an abuser and a victim. Uh, but I would kind of be quite interested in trying to apply these design interventions uh, of where this kind of relationship isn't as clear. Uh, but yeah, that's a great question. It's always something which I think there's lots of different dynamics which aren't immediately represented in my design um, kind of activities but let's see kind of how that they might be applied. Do they work, do they not, and that kind of thing. All right, so we have time for another question <laughs> from Zoom. Um, I'll go in the order that questions are received. So can you expand on the sense of oh. inevitability that mm -hmm. you observe? What leads to individuals seeing abusive behavior as inevitable, inevitable and which behaviors aren't they seeing as options? Okay, yep, also uh, uh, getting so many great questions. Well done, everyone. Um, so uh, abusers can often see uh, their behaviors, uh, and I use the kind of term inevitable in the sense that uh, how they will currently describe their abusive behavior, such as, for example, the, uh, the sample kind of post in which I presented through the forums of where they will point to various different aspects from the context, they say, which directly provoked this kind of behavior as in someone felt compelled to behave abusively uh, because they felt morally wronged in some way. Uh, so for example, when uh, abusers right at the start might frame themselves as the victim. So for example, they might have used, they might describe using their violence to um, try and help uh, a survivor or, or protect them from um, kind of causing further harm uh, to themselves or their children, uh, which are, are situations which are inherently kind of rare. And uh, one of the main behaviors, uh, which is where uh, quite a lot of my work is currently going on is actually financial abuse. Uh, many uh, abusers do not see the kind of financial control or uh, the restriction to the use of financial um, kind of services, whether these are digital or not, as being inherently abusive. Um, in fact, quite a lot of abusive behaviors uh, can actually manifest as care, such as I am taking complete control of the finances so you don't have to think about it. Um, also, it can also manifest as um, this is my responsibility or gender norms, such as I am the main kind of uh, breadwinner or stakeholder uh, in this family um, household. Um, you don't necessarily need to see these financial kind of services or have access to these services because I'm managing that. And that's something that I do um, normally kind of as a man or expressing my masculinity. Um, so happy to discuss that in a bit more. There's there's different ways in which which folks uh, can can see or frame their abuse as being inevitable, uh, but those are the two that kind of stick out to me uh, immediately. So thanks for the question. That's great. Great, thank you. So uh, we there's more questions in the mm -hmm. chat. So for folks who we don't get to get your questions, feel free to uh, reach out to Rosie directly. Yep. I'm being told that we have to wrap up because there's a class <laughs> starting here momentarily. Nice. But thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rosie, for the wonderful talk you've done and impressive. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks very much for having me.